Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Martinez, the founder of Little With Great Love, and I am joined today by our spiritual mom, speaker, and teammate contributor, Tammy McCarthy, and we have a great extra bonus for you today. Well, you know, we've been talking so much this past uh, few weeks about our journey into do you want to be well? And, you know, we it's come up in our blog post. We've been talking about it on social media, really digging in this Lent into, you know, going beyond going. Be, let's let's look at do you want to be well? And then what comes after that? What comes after being well and restoration? Well, today we're going to talk about five steps to fruitfulness. And Lisa's going to throw a slide up here. We're going to talk about going beyond do you wish to be well to do you want to live a life of fruitfulness, a life that has, you know, bold meaning where the Lord just continues to speak into your life. So Lisa, you know, you and I enjoy our, our weekly conversations where we get to kind of chat about stuff like this. And recently we've started to say, we're going to have to record some of these things because, you know, our, our guest, the Holy Spirit tends to come in and foster some pretty great conversations. And, um, you know, this, this little talk came together pretty quickly in the way that he likes to order things. So why don't you walk us through, um, you know, kind of these steps, maybe, you know, one by one, and we can just kind of talk it through and let everyone know where we, where we are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful how the Lord works. And we felt like, how do we kind of enter into this week? But it's not right. Just about Holy Week. It's about living out resurrection. So uh, with the women that we've been journeying with, in particular, this Lent through our wellness program, and then with our greater community, we're in the final weeks here, right? So this is Holy Week and next week we share resurrection. And in order to, I think, really enter into that, we wanted to kind of unlock some keys here. And the first one being, um, if you look at the list here of five things, is acceptance and intention. So what we've talked about, uh, when we think about like wellness and well-being, what I've really come to know through my own story particularly um, mainly like through grief and infertility and trauma, is that if I'm constantly fighting against what God has me going through at that time or my actual reality, that's the first kind of key to opening it, right? Is I have to accept my situation. I have to accept the circumstances that I'm in. I have to accept that, you know, kind of things that maybe I never thought I'd have to endure you know, or some things that I always wanted, you know, whatever it was that I dreamed of my life of having children and whatever, of is coming to accept that and then having intentionality around that acceptance, right? So that I can kind of really embrace that. That's the first kind of just key in order to get to these next steps is just starting with that. And once you kind of set your intention upon something and say, um, this isn't what I thought it was going to be like. <laughs> this wasn't what I planned for. Uh, I don't even like this. And so the feelings come up, right? And that's what we're talking about, emotions, about emotional wellness. And when you can start to not try to suppress those feelings and say, no, no, I don't want to feel that. I just want to whatever. But I can start to realize that those things are coming up as a natural kind of inclination against my current circumstances, which isn't something I, I like, you know? <laughs> and I can just say, hey, you're human. Yeah, you know? Uh, Jesus struggled himself, right? As we're coming into Good Friday, Jesus himself said, take the cup away, <laughs> but your will, not my will. That's the key, right? We're going to get that comes to number two there, right? But before we get to number two, we have to accept it and we have to have an intention. He still knew that this is what you've created me for. This is my mission and I choose to accept it. And so his intention was set that everything that he did was in order to fulfill that particular purpose, right? And I think something that you said there that I think is is really pivotal is also having knowledge of ourselves, right? So having real knowledge of the situation, 
I know multiple times in my life when I've been going through something, I'm like, Lord, give me a different perspective on how to view this. And I think it's the difference between, you know, the flailing toddler, you know, there's like those little videos where the toddler is like flailing in the water and the mom's like, just stand up, you know, and they, they, they think they're in like 12 feet of water and the mom's like, stand up, you know, it's like less than a foot. But it's just like this idea of like, am I ex- accepting my current state of where I am? Like, am I done flailing? And not like in a surrender way yet, but like in a, do I know where I am? Okay, I'm in water. It's not as deep as it looks. Okay, I'm kind of panicking. I have all these emotions. And I think, you know, going back to that, like toddler that's flailing, it's like first recognizing the truth of the situation. Because I think sometimes we can over-dramatize our situations because we just see them in a very limited mindset. You know, we only see one possible door, one possible way for it to get fixed. And that typically means pluck me out of here. Right? Done. <laughs> I'm done. I don't need to be here. I don't know what you're thinking, but you and I never got to this point where I was supposed to be here. So I think that's the first thing is like, you know, what is, what's God's intention and where he has me. And let me sit with that for a second. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then I think, and Lisa, to go on to your second point, then there's that surrender. Right. Because I've acknowledged this. I've accepted this. I've set my intention. I think it's really important, actually, the way that we talk to ourselves also about those situations. If we're the kid in the water and we're just like, I hate this. I never asked for this. And we're just freaking out. You know, my old, our old friend, Father Pio Maria, right, of the good CFR friend from Franciscan, he'd say, don't freak out, Lisa. You think that's doing something? It's not doing anything. You feel like you're doing something by freaking out, but you're actually making it worse. So if you could just be like, say, like, I want to freak out. That's how I used to be even like maybe even yesterday. OK, like we can just acknowledge that and then just come in and say, I'm choosing to accept my situation. I'm choosing to have an intention set that I want to do God's will. Right. So then I move into two. I'm going to surrender my will. Right. Wait, I, one more thing. I, you you, you yeah. made me think of something. The yeah. other thing that we're not forgetting, if we get back to our little splashing kid scenario, is that you have Satan, you know, who's on the sidelines going, that water's 12 feet deep. <laughs> you know, you don't have a life jacket. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to save you. No one's going to help you out. And it's like, you also have all, you have your own prevailing thoughts, but then you have these thoughts that the evil one comes in with and he exacerbates your thoughts. So. You know, you're not just now flailing in water, but, you know, he's got you thinking that, like, nobody cares about you. Nobody's watching you in this situation. So you're also coming up against that. So I want people to also understand we also get that because that happens to every one of us. Every one of us has those thoughts where that old tape, whatever your tape is, Heather Kim talks about from Abiding Together, talks about having this tape that plays and it's like, Whenever the tape starts to play, it's like, oh, this is my song, but not in a positive way. Yeah. You know, th- this is my song of I feel rejected. This is my song of I'm not enough. I haven't been seen. And Satan plays that song in whatever our situation is. No one's noticing you. You know, you haven't been seen. You're going to drown and no one's going to care. So I think that's another thing. Like, we don't want to act like these steps are super easy. Uh, to accomplish, but we do see in working through them, there's such beautiful fruit through them. So even if you find yourself, um, I say this as a person who, who struggles sometimes with being strategic, if you find yourself sitting at number one or in between one and two for a little bit, praise God, you know, because this is what we're doing. We're trying to move through, we're trying to move through this, but part of that is also, it, it is movement. Yeah. You know, it's it's us having to make a commitment, a daily commitment to move to, you know, that next number. Right, Lisa? Exactly. And I think if you, if you can just accept that 
you're going to process, go through this process the way you're going to go through it, whether you're, you know, itching, whether you are backsliding, whether you had to take a pause, tap out, I'm so over this right now, Jesus, whatever it is, you know, and stop seeing that little dog laying on the thing, like, I can't adult today, whatever, it's okay. And like, what we do is like, we try to laugh with each other, just be like, you know right. what, like, today, it's just I'm in the store, man, and I don't have an umbrella, and this is how it is, you know. That humor was a gift that the both gives God's given us both, and I think that's how we've stayed friends over all these years is because we share that same sense of humor, right? But we share that spirituality, which number two, surrendering to God's will. I think that surrender is just like that's what Christ showed us, right? Not my will, but your will be done. And what an example that is, not just he said it, but he lived that way, right? And he wanted to show that model, that acceptance now turned into surrender. Okay, I've set my intention on this. Now I'm letting go, right? And realize that that letting go isn't like one and done, you know? (laughs) Letting go is every moment of every day. And it's easy to let go of something and then be like, oh, God, you know, what if, what if we did this, you know? Oh, oh, this would be so cool if you answered my prayer like this. We love to tell God how to answer prayers. We love to tell God exactly what we need. And, you know, we want to see that healing and we want whatever. And realize I was just listening to um, uh, one of the witnesses and, and the chosen. And this woman was saying, for 20 years, my illness has served God's purpose for me. That a healing not that's not what god has physically on earth for every single person and if we could surrender that i want to be healed you know whatever whatever that illness was cancer uh you know any kind of uh you know ongoing chronic pain anything like migraines for me infertility those things people have prayed for this for years god wants to use perhaps that situation to minister to another person that's going through the same thing to give hope. So if I can surrender my agenda for that particular thing, and all I'm doing is asking God for the same thing over and over and over, and I only see one way that we get this, the answer is yes. My body has a baby. That's it. That's all I want. You know, you're not a vending machine, God. I don't put in my prayer and I get out the baby. Mm you know, and stuff that I'm actually allowing myself to come into relationship with you and realize that you might have these kids out there that need my husband and I as their parents, because they're in a very difficult situation because they're in a broken family. They're in a home with a parent that is not capable of loving them the way that they need to be loved. And if I can surrender to that will and start to move in the direction that God wants me to, then we can get to three. But what do you have on surrender, Tan? I know you got something. Well, I was just going to say, I think the other thing is that we have to understand that that God understands the value of that. Yeah. You know, I think that sometimes we're like, God, do you know how hard it is for me to do this? Like, do you know how hard it is for me to trust? And I think he does. Yeah. And I think that, I think it's sort of like, you know, um, I, I joke around that there's different values that different ones, different children I have possessed, you know, like I know that this child who doesn't really compliment a lot, like if they have a compliment come out of the water, like out of nowhere, I'm just like, I can sit and dwell on that all day long because yeah. I'm like, wow, like I, that was so beautiful that I didn't have to ask for that. Like that I didn't have to elicit that. She freely gave that over knowing that it's hard for her to identify with those feelings. So the value of that to me, because I know her struggle, magnifies that, right? And it's going to magnify my response to to the compliment, you know, or to a child who I see, you know, sharing with their siblings when they tend to be more of self, more selfish in nature. It's like you recognize what someone struggles with. And when you see them freely choosing to surrender that, that struggle, it, it's all the more beautiful. And yeah. I think that's something that we have to look at with the Lord is that when we're surrendering that, I mean, he knows, you know, it's the whole garden scene all over again, right? It's this idea of like, 
is God holding out on me? Do I have to, do I have to like eat this apple and see for myself what's best for me? You know, and to be in a point where we're saying, okay, Lord, what's best for me? Here's my will. You know, I'm, I'm not going to think I have to do this alone. I'm not going to think that it's, I'm going to struggle the rest of my earthly existence and that you are going to be aloof from me, but I'm going to, I'm going to lean into that. And I think that, that there is, um, I can speak only for myself that the number of times that I have surrendered a situation over. And when I mean surrender it, I don't mean like, you know, I, um, I kind of like Martha Stewart in it in a, like a really cute little package, you know, and like wrote my to God from Tammy. Like, you know, I mean, like I'm pretty much like death gripping it as I give it to him, but I'm still death gripping it. Yeah. But I'm like smiling the whole time. Like, this is who I want to be, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, come on, that's valid. Yeah. That, that's still surrender. That's still me fighting my own will. And I think that's, that is, you know, right now, Lisa, you and I have talked about this. We always want to be honest with people. Yeah. We don't want to give, we want to be authentic in the struggle for our faith. And there's going to be times where it's easier for us to surrender because we can't figure out an earthly way for it to happen. And so we just kind of give over. But then sometimes when we can kind of maybe figure out a solution, old self-reliance comes back in and we don't mm. want to have to rely on that. So I think when we can get to, you know, number three, this enlightenment, it's, yeah. it's kind of your Martha Stewart moment, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know what? I really think you can make this so much nicer than I can, you know, or I want to, I want to kind of give this to you. And yeah. I think that there's been times, you know, Lisa, we've both talked about that. There's been times where we've come to this point. Yeah. you know, in, in a situation where we're like, man, I don't, you know, I just had this like incredible prayer time. And I just like began to realize like the Lord was really showing me that I need to, I need to really understand that I'm beloved. And if I'm beloved and that's how the person that I'm handing something to is sees me, then here's this and that, and the thing in my closet and the thing in my car I'm holding on to, and, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that if you can, I think for me, it's realizing God is good. If I can understand, I have a loving father. He's called me. He's chosen me. He wants what's best for me. And then I can start to realize that his will holds into account so many things that I have no knowledge and I have no privilege of knowing because he knows everything and he knows everything about everyone in all of creation for all of time. So his will allows to see all those things and it's pulling from all of those things to create this perfectly imperfect plan for me and my vocation to do my purpose, right? So if I can start to really trust God then I can come to adore his will, right? Because it's not this old man in the sky who's like, yeah, you know, let's just see what I can throw at you today and let's see how you do with it, minion, you know, and stuff. No, it's not. It's you're my beloved child and I want you in eternity with me. And my plan has a way for you to accomplish that and do good work for me on this earth. You willing to, or can you show up? Can you say yes? Can you just follow through? If you can do those few things, then it's starting to be like, okay, his will puts into account things I can't see. His will loves me and wants good things for me. His will is bringing me my vocation every moment. It's bringing me communion with Christ. It's bringing his love to other people. And it leads us to these other things, right? It leads us to four and five, which we'll get to in a second. But I think that that key then is having this proper understanding of who God is. Because if we don't see him as a loving father, but he is this abstract universe, 
<laughs> whatever the heck that is, then yeah, it's going to be weird to think about how do I want these things that are out of my control and they don't seem to be getting me closer to what it is I want. Then I'm going to come up against it. Yeah. And, but I think the other thing about that too, is when we look at, you know, we're taught, you know, not to compare with people, you know, we're taught to not live a life where we're, you know, envious of other people or that we're comparing our, our lives with other people. But what if we allowed God's plan for somebody else to inspire us? Mm. You know, what if it's that, you know, when I'm looking at somebody else and I'm looking at what God has done in this person's life, or I'm, I'm hearing this powerful story of God's glory and I'm, and instead of my mind going into envy, my mind goes into, you know, the virtue that's associated with envy. So if you don't, if you're not envious, there's charity, right? So I have charity toward my neighbor, but not only just charity toward my neighbor, but my mind is starting to go, that's also my father. Like this, this God that reached out to this man who was suicidal and God put somebody in his path and this person saved his life that night. That's also my dad. And if I can look at that, then maybe when I flip that and I can look at that person adoring where God has them, because in their mindset, they had themselves leaving this earth. And God has restored their, their vision of who they're called to be and really just kind of spoken into that. Can I look at that as a catalyst for myself? You know, can I look at that and say, Lord, give me a better vision for what you're doing in my life. And maybe the Lord, the, the vision he will give me is to put me outside of myself. And for me to be somebody looking in on my life and saying, I went through this and this is where he met me. And then we had this struggle and this is, this is how he's always provided. This is how he's always shown up. And then we begin to kind of minister to ourselves through our own story. And then it comes to this point where it's like, well, of course, why yes. wouldn't, why wouldn't I adore his will for my life? Because as I look around and see all of his other beloved children, that he has ransomed with his life, you know, all of a sudden it makes it clear, like, why wouldn't I want him to take whatever I have and turn it into this, you know, beautiful life that is beyond what I could imagine. And I think that that's, Lisa, you and I had talked about this before. Enlightenment kind of means you have to take um, like a step up, you know, you, you kind of um, raise your perspective. And I think that's what we do spiritually. Spiritually, we ask the Lord to take us to a different, a different level, a different, you know, maybe we'll say it like this in terms of St. Teresa of Avila, you know, in the interior castle, it's a different level of your spiritual life where you start to not just accept, but you start to have this adoration for who God is and not just who he is, but the struggles that he does give you. Because you recognize that every trial, every suffering, every sacrifice is an opportunity to lean more into dependence on him and less into self-reliance. And I think that that's one of the most damaging things about the prosperity gospel mm. is that it, it's so damaging because what it teaches people, and I've ran into this with some family members, um, what it teaches people is that if you are in alignment with the Lord, then you will be blessed spiritually, financially. You will have prosperity. If you doubt who God is, that is why you are lacking in these areas. Right. Uh -huh. Because you are, you are always meant to prosper. And the sad part about this, and that's why I, I say it not with like an eye roll. I say it with like a general sadness is that's not who Christ was when he was here. He wasn't the man that was prospering. You know, he was the man that was scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of poverty and, 
and what he called his disciples to have. And he didn't knock on doors and ask for the best room because do you know who I am? Yeah. You know, and he was the one that said, you're not even taking a second club. You're not taking your sandals. You're just going to show up and you're going to be at the mercy of people who, yeah. you know, and that is a totally different perspective. But fruitful, right? Yes. He wasn't quote unquote prospering in terms of finances or he had the best job title or he had the best camel you know or whatever right. that he wrote but he was so fruitful in his ministry I mean they 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 the crowds and how they came you know how did we start holy week you know on uh, Palm Sunday I mean everybody for him right and the same people on Palm Sunday said crucify him on Good Friday you know, it's, we're that fickle, guys. I mean, God knows this about us, right? Well, and I think if we go back for a second, I think that sometimes people want to make it about, um, about financial success. Yeah. You know, it's like, you look at people like just St. Joseph of Arimathea, like there were people that, that Jesus had in his circle that had influence yeah. and that had finances, but they, that wasn't where they, where they put their prosperity and their value yeah, and their yeah. exactly and i think one of the things that I, I bring up this prosperity gospel is because i don't want it to be that when the lord allows suffering or the lord allows trials that somehow people look inward and say this is me not trying you know yeah. and, they, and they make it about themselves like i want them to see it as a loving father who's like I want you to come to me. You know, I want you to be with me in this moment. I want to carry you through this. Yeah. I don't want you to be built on self-reliance. I want you to walk with me and I want to grow closer to you. And I want to lead you to, you know, into these, this fruitfulness that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. think ultimately, what does that look like? Well, you know, to your, for number four, it, it, it looks like prayer. Yeah. You know, it looks like finding time in silence and, and solitude, things that were modeled for us by Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how we come into a relationship, right? Is that we have to communicate, we have to talk, you know, we have to be authentic in our prayer. You know, it wasn't, I mean, Jesus taught us, you know, it wasn't about our words or that we have to do a million devotions or that there's so many things it's like what do i want i want your heart i want you <laughs> i want to really know what's going on with you i want you to be real with me in prayer because what happens in prayer is we were just a lot of the points that we actually are talking about were found in um, so i did a talk last year that's on youtube um, we can give a link to that on Sister Josepha Menendez. The way of divine love is just this beautiful love story about the devotion to the Sacred Heart. And we did a whole series last year on the Sacred Heart, Saints of the Sacred Heart. Now, she's not a saint yet, um, but she is mystic and was um, around the same time as Our Lady of Fatima was happening in Portugal. She um, had gone from Spain to a, a convent in France and was having these revelations from Christ himself about the Sacred Heart. So what we were taking was one of the passages that he was talking about, which is which these were lessons that he was letting her know that he was giving to Sister Josepha as he was preparing to die, right? So throughout this week, you know, he's letting her know um, what's the one necessary thing that is going into his time where he knows in the garden, I have to get ready. They're about to descend. They're going to arrest me. And this is going to happen, you know, and stuff. So he's been doing his ministry for three years. He has been teaching and training them. He's been living with them. He's been all these things. And now it's coming to this supreme act, right, of this, you know, where he's laying down his life. This is what he was sent to do. And so he acknowledges, like, your nature is going to revolt naturally, you know, like whatever it is that you're going to do, like that's humanness, right? That's coming through. He was fully human and fully divine. So he fully felt as a human, everything that we feel when we're faced with an incredible suffering 
sacrifice, whatever those things are, big, small, whatever, he felt those same things that we feel. But his thing that was necessary was prayer, because it's only through prayer, these are my notes, that a soul can obtain the strength that we need for life's challenges. That that's how we do it, guys. He vivifies us through prayer. He gives us the strength. And in prayer, this is where God, this is so beautiful. So in prayer, we can say, you know, we can pour out, you know, and stuff like that. Pour out our weakness. Pour out our worries. Pour out our concerns. Put in our little list of requests. You know, whatever it is that we're doing. We're just showing up. We're doing how we do. But what does God do? He communicates himself to us. The God of all creation communicates himself to us through prayer. Like, think about that for a second if you haven't thought about that lately. That's insane. First of all, and second of all, he gives us counsel. And third of all, he inspires us. And he'll give us exactly what we need in those moments of prayer, in the silence and the solitude. So what Jesus did in Gethsemane was he pulled himself away to be silent, to be in solitude with God. Why? Because God's within. He has to go within to commune with God and to get everything he's going to need. And it was, you know, he acknowledged that there's these interior arguments that come up, our own self-love, our own sensuality. These things come up. What happens? We immediately start to get distracted. You know, he wasn't sitting there in the scripture and saying, hey, you know, yelling to the guys over there. Why are you guys sleeping? You know, he was present to God in these moments. He dealt with them when he went over there. You know, a bunch of knuckleheads um, sleeping on the job here. Come on. It's like can't even stay awake for an hour. But he was here with the Lord and he was receiving from him everything he needed. He didn't allow himself to get all caught up in the distraction. Right. So we got to check ourselves. We got to pull out. You know, our mind is probably going to kick up and we're going to start thinking about the grocery list or whatever, you know, and stuff. But we can have to quiet those things bring ourselves back into silence and solitude and allow ourselves to then receive the inspiration of grace. The things that come up want to start to pull us away from finding God within us. That's the enemy is going to start to throw things at us. Our own, our own uh, tape will start playing, whatever those things are going to try to pull us. But in that, you know, we find God within and then he's going to give us everything that we need to do those next steps. So Christ actually in the garden was faced with everything. I mean, why did he sweat blood? Because he not only saw, this is what he tells Joseph, I didn't just see every sin. I was invested in everything that happened from the beginning of time until the end of time. He saw every offense and sin ever. and all of that guilt was upon him and he felt all of the justice and anger of a righteous god against all those offenses i mean we you know we like to paint the picture of like oh you know this old testament god being all wrathful uh he had a reason to be that way because by right. his justice these are true offenses they didn't just do, I mean, these people were building false idols and doing all kinds of insanity. And the stuff we're still doing today, killing babies and, you know, whatever is going on. These are true offenses against the heart of God. And he has a right to be angry. I mean, don't we get angry if someone cuts us off in traffic? Imagine what it's like, you know, when he sees someone committing grave offenses time after time after time. Well, I think we also, you know, for us to really understand what it means to be omniscient, omnipresent, yeah. you know, omnipotent, like all of these things, you know, we have this dichotomy with God where it's like, you know, God's infinite, you know, mercy combating with this, with him being perfection, the need for justice, yeah. you know, and so we, you kind of battle the two of those. And I've, I've heard some people speak mostly, um, you know, atheist comments where they will say things like, you know, why does your God require human sacrifice? You know, why does your God, you know, and it's like, you look at this and it's like the justice, the, the amount of evil that is 
pervading what he has created. You know, it, the, the blood of the holy innocents, you know, there's, there's justice needed for all of that, you know, that there, there can't be that um, the Lord allows this, you know, this evil to prevail. And I think, you know, when we talk about prayer, we're talking also about endurance. You know, we don't just run one race. We run multiple marathons, <laughs> you know, every couple of weeks we're mm. running multiple marathons. You know, it tells us in, um, I believe it's in Ephesians where it talks about, you know, we don't just, we're not fighting each other and, and leaders. We're fighting principalities. Mm. You know, our fight is, is the fight where we can't grow too tired. We have to keep on going. Yeah. Well, how do you do that? How do we, how do we keep going in a fight that we're exhausted before we start because we're still battling the last one that hasn't fully ended. And I think that's where we look at it and we say with, with being refilled, yeah, we go before the creator. We have time. We go within, we have times of silence. We allow him to speak wor- life giving words over us. We allow him to, through the, the Holy Eucharist to, to, to be fed to be strengthened. We look at these, you know, I, I think of the sacraments as sort of like, you know, that's like the Gatorade you get as you're running, you know, and you're like mm-hmm. throwing it all over yourself and like drinking <laughs> it on the marathon. It's like, that's confession, you know? Yeah. It's like, that's when you get to go and, um, you know, have a holy hour. And that's when you get to go to mass. And it's like, you're kind of taking in all of these things along the journey that are providing spiritual refreshment yeah. and nourishment and and that's what we're that's where we're going to be getting this endurance from and this ability to to continue to be fruitful right yeah it's not just elbow grease it right it's not just like try harder tammy you know <laughs> just be more surrendering just be better you know i think that when we pray um that's the perfect place to lay out our emotions right Mm -hmm. We can just bring those under God's authority. I I think, you know, sometimes we feel things that we don't want to feel and we want to kind of like pretty things up for the Lord. You know, let me go through, let me get out a nice prayer book, you know, and stuff like that. Let me do my litanies. Let me do my rosaries. Let me do all those things. I'm not saying that those are bad. Those are beautiful traditions of the church and the faith. They all have a purpose. But what's real so you can just sit there. I mean, I literally remember sometimes sitting in the chapel and I would have like one foot ready to go out the door and I'd be like, I don't like you right now. I don't like what you're doing. I don't want to be here. I don't want to talk to you. I don't, you know, like I didn't pretty it up for Jesus. Why? Because he already knows my heart. So what? I'm going to sit there and try to like act apart with him. If I can't be real with God, I mean, who can I be real with? He can take the anger. He could take the sadness. He can take every emotion. He is the one that all those things should properly come out to. Don't take it out on your cat. Don't take it out on your husband. Don't take it out on your kids. Whoever it is, your roommate, take it out with him. I have had so many. I mean, I love like getting in the car. And I think people are like either that girl's like really singing or like she is like legit insane because I will like take a long car ride and sometimes just turn off the radio and be like, okay, God, we're going to go now, you know, and stuff like that. It's go time, you know, and stuff. What well, are gonna... you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, I, I think the, um, the other thing is like, I was talking to my daughter about this once, you know, she said, you know, mom, I wish I was, I wish I was a cleaner person. Mm. And we were talking about like cleaning up her room or whatever. And I said, well, just like pretend like you are mm-hmm. like, just like everyone's well, just like pretend, no. you know, make your bed. Like, and, and I was, it's such a metaphor for like in our spiritual life, when there's times where we come before the Lord and we're like, I don't, I don't know that I believe this. Yeah. You know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, I don't know that I believe this, but I'm here. Yeah. Like I'm showing up, you show up and I'm going to show up. And you're going to have to continue to chip away at this heart of mine. Yeah. You know, or you think about like, you know, doubting Thomas 
Like, think about the words from his lips when he said, you know, Lord, I believe, like, help my unbelief. Yeah. I mean, here's the guy, here's Jesus standing in front of him, and he's going, help my unbelief. Yeah. You know, that's a prayer that I say all the time when it's in the mass and, you know, I'm getting distracted and it's like right before the consecration and yeah. I'm, you know, what is my, are my teenagers still talking? You know, yeah. like yeah. what is my son falling asleep? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to like mother everybody yeah. in the pew, yeah. you know, and it, it comes to that moment and, and maybe I'm just not, you know, some days I'm there. Yeah. And some days I'm like everywhere else, but there. And it comes to that moment and it's like this, this unification happens with God and I, and I go, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, you know, help the part of me that like looks at you and go, how is this possible in a little white host? Like, yeah. how is this possible? But also, you know what? but you, but, but you and I both know this, Yeah. like there's tangible times in our life where the Lord has been there in that moment where oh, yeah. we, we remember. And it's like, so that's what you do. You show up, you keep walking, you keep, yeah. you keep journeying, you keep pushing through, you push through the doubt, you push through um, the voices in your head, you push through your own fatigue, your own mental state, you know, whatever it may be, this is what we're called to do. And this is the grace, right? The grace is what he gives us to do that. The other thing that I was thinking of, I, I was watching this vocation story of this priest. It was really powerful. He was like so in love with this girl and he thought he had met the girl he was going to marry and they dated. And it was really through his relationship that he came to realize like he had felt called before, but it was kind of always like, I don't want that. I don't want to be a priest, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And um, so I'll have to find what the link is for this, this vocation story because it's really beautiful, but this priest was just like so powerful in his testimony and that he would say, finally, like when it was coming up again about becoming a priest while he's dating this girl and in, in love with her, he he said, I, I don't want this, you know, and stuff. And he was like having to do all these things, like show up to the vocations director and like, and he would just tell the vocations director, like, I don't want to be a priest at all. Like, you know, and then they'd be like, here's an application, you know, and stuff. I mean, it was like all these things were like God's will was coming and he was just like, what the crap, you know, and stuff. But I love this prayer that he said, because it was so real, right? The point of my thing wasn't to be like, I'm going to beat you up, God, every time I see you. No, was to, I'm just going to present myself as I am in this moment. Yeah. But I want you to elevate me, right? This is what we just talked about, right? You're going to come down to me. I'm going to go up to you, right? I want you to elevate me. So he said, you're going to have to change my heart or answer my prayer. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, such a great little takeaway for number four. Change my heart or answer my prayer. You're coming up against your own will, right? If we're coming up with two, we're struggling with one or two, <laughs> which is to back it up, to bring it forward, you know? Because we should start with prayer, right? But we're bringing it down to like, these are kind of the steps that you're going into it with. But when you go into that, if we're struggling with acceptance or surrender or coming to adore his will, change my heart or answer my prayer. This guy came to love the rosary and came to love Our Lady. He never had a connection with Our Lady. He prays four rosaries a day. He's like, by the time you get to the fourth rosary, he's like, it opens up. And I'm like, dude, you are better than I. I can't get <laughs> out just trying to do what? <laughs> you know, and stuff. <laughs> And so, but it's so beautiful that Our Lady was the key for him. Why? Because she brings us to Jesus, right? And she was revealing him. He kind of, I think, needed some mothering. He needed some nurturing from her to come alongside and say, let's take that heart of yours. That's hardened. That's stuck in this place. You want to have kids. You want to have a wife. You had an idea about what your life was going to look like. And this guy loves being a priest. You can just see it's like all over him. He is like saturated, you know, and stuff. So I just think that that's such a great prayer. Change my heart or answer my prayer and then see what God does. Like really surrender that. Because if you're just like, um, change my heart or answer my prayer and you're really pulling for one of those, you know, then again, <laughs> you're kind of not really surrendering. Like you're really like having like a dog in the fight where you kind of just like kind of open your hands with the Lord and just say, look, I, I don't, I'm not there yet, but I want to get there. 
And what St. Therese, our patroness, um, would say was the desire. You could even pray for the desire to want to something. Lord, I don't want to surrender. I don't want this particular outcome to happen. I want my outcome, right? I'm really pushing yeah. for this to happen. But give me the even the desire to want to let go. Give me the desire to want your will. And that gives God something, right? Is if you don't feel like you have nothing, I just want what I want, or I'm just praying for specific things, or I just, I don't have any strength left and I'm so exhausted and I can't take this anymore. That you just say, I want to want to, and God will take that little teeny mustard seed and just blow it out, right? And I, I think that that mustard seed is a good, it's kind of a, a good catalyst to number five, which yeah. is love. Yeah. You know, we've, um, Lisa and I were talking about this earlier today, you know, there's the, the New Testament kind of comes in and, you know, we've got Jesus saying to these Pharisees and these, you know, the scribes that are like, that's, that's not the law. You know, yeah. we've got Jesus healing on the Sabbath and he says to them, you know, I came to fulfill the law. And then they try to trap him. And he they said, what is the, you know, the greatest command? And he says, you know, the greatest commandment is to love. And you can look at that and say, oh, this is so simple. You know, I mean, this is, this is number five in fruitfulness. So we've got, we've got to like a big pinnacle point right here. Yeah. Right? And it's like, it's not that simple because when you, when your intention it can't just be that the product is love. It has to be that my intention, my engagement, everything that I do is to love a person. And when that gets involved, when my when my starting point is love, I can't use words like tolerate. Mm -hmm. I can't use words like settle for, you know, okay with. Like I have to love a person to the fullest extent of who that person is. Oh. And I was talking to my children this one day and we were talking about just a bunch of different like societal issues. And I said, guys, let me tell you something. My desire is always for when people, when they meet me to say, I don't know, she loved me first. Like that was the first thing I met when I met her was like, I met somebody who met me in love and every conversation that we've had since then has been at the root of that. Mm. Because when it really comes down to it, like my desire is not to convert people to the faith. My desire is to love people into seeing the love that God the Father has for them and for that to motivate them. Because I think that is what builds community. Absolutely. That is what gives me the right for when this person comes to me and says, hey, what's your view on this? I say, hey, we're not even friends yet. Why do you want to know my view on that? Like, we're not friends. <laughs> you know, like, let's let's build our community because yeah. you know what? As of right now, it's just a political debate. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. This, that, that just reminds me. Uh, so I was walking down the street uh, here in Austin the other day. You know, it's a it's a, it's a pretty pretty crazy town and some in, yeah. in regards to like political views let's just say okay yeah. so it doesn't matter red red blue whatever you are right but i'm just saying you know there's certain agendas right that are are very pervasive in the capital here so i'm going down the street and there's these two planned parenthoods uh people standing there and stuff they've got their clipboards and they're like whatever so the first time i walked by and it wasn't just like I walked by and I did I did that thing that I was like trying to whatever. Like I actually like tried to make eye, eye contact and smile and like say hi, you know, and stuff. I didn't really know who they were with, but then looked down to see the shirt and I was like, ah, you know, and stuff like that. And then I went and did my errands. I did my thing. And I was walking back and they were still there outside the store that I was going to go into, Trader Joe's. And they didn't have anybody around them this time. And they saw me coming back and they looked at me. And instead of saying anything else, all she said was, do you support Planned Parenthood? It's all she said. It wasn't like, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, what a beautiful day. Like, yeah. you look great today or anything that was like relational. Mm -hmm. It was like agenda driven, right? Do you support Planned Parenthood? And the only thing that came out of my mouth was no. 
I mean, I literally could have, I have been like pro-life my entire life. I've gone to the March for Life. I've organized trips to the March for Life. I mean, I could have sat there and like, just been like, I was just at the library doing research for an infertility devotional because I haven't been able to have children for 12 years. Do you think that I want to kill babies? Actually, all the ladies at your place that want to kill them, I know all the ladies that want them. So send them over to us. I mean, we could have gone toe to toe on this. I mean, I could have ripped her up and down, you know, and stuff like that. And the other dude that was with her. And I just said, no, <laughs> I kept walking. <laughs> and there, she was like, okay, you know, and then the other guy was like, have a nice day. Like, so like loaded, like that tone that wasn't even like authentic at all. Yeah. And I thought, you know, how different that conversation could have been if they would have just loved me or tried to have any kind of relationship with me. If I would have been on the side, not for parenthood, of course, if for Planned Parenthood, if I would have been out there for pro-life, I mean, in this city, you'd get torn a, a new one, I'm sure. But if I was out there outside of Trader Joe's trying to get people to sign up for right to life, I don't think I would have said, hey, you guys for right for life. Like. I don't think that's a good like opener, right? right. Because yeah. immediately we've set ourselves on political sides. We've said, I'm this side. Where do you stand? I don't care anything about you. I just want to know where you stand on this belief. I don't want to get to know you. I want you to sign my petition. I want Texas to be able to start killing children again, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So anyways, I'd say like this is a huge one. And my love for them at that time was not to rip them a new one and try to prove my point. Because first of all, I don't even know them. <laughs> Second of all, I don't think that my rant is gonna change their minds. <laughs> but I think that maybe if I would have gone in and got a couple beverages or something and came out and like gave them a couple cold drinks and said, hey guys, we may not agree on this particular thing, but um, I just wanted, you guys have been standing out here for hours. Maybe you're thirsty. So, you know, I serve a God that says, you know, I, you're thirsty. I gave you a drink. I'm going to pray for you. And, I'm, and um, I hope this kind of blesses your day. How could I have loved and mutually served them and come into communion with them? You know, maybe it would be to let them let them tell their story to me and just listen to what their side was, right? Listen to why they're so passionate about Planned Parenthood, what brought them to that, you know, and stuff. I don't know what my role could have been, except that I did pray for them as I went away, you know, and stuff, because it was sad. I was saddened by it, you know, and stuff. Yeah. But the communion is not just we're talking about communion with each other. It's receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. That's what gives us the strength to love. We're not, again, we're not elbow greasing it. It's actually a fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit does not come through trying harder. Its fruitfulness comes through our submission and our acceptance of things and allowing God to send that to us and him elevating us. We don't just virtue our way out of a box here and we just every day say, I'm going to be more patient. You know, <laugh> stuff like that. Dang it, I'm going to be patient today. You know? I'm going to love you. <laughs> I'm going to really, really love you. I don't like anything about what you did right there, and I don't like who you are, but man, you know, no, we don't, we don't try to just do it of our own accord. We really have to ask the Lord to give us the grace and the strength to be able to have the fruits of the Spirit, to be fruitful in our love, and it's really to have, you know, I've, I've gone through really difficult things, and Tammy, you have too. We've been through uh, this journey with each other for the past three years in this ministry, but we've journeyed with each other for years before that. And we've been through some really tough stuff in life. And the only way is by his grace. It's him, Amen. us kind of submitting to him and allowing him, us receiving the sacraments, us speaking life into each other, us sharing our stories. Why do we have this ministry? Not to like be these big, you know, so full of ourselves that we have to put our stories out there because, you know, there's a gazillion blogs out there. That's not why we're doing it is to propagate our own agenda. It's just so that people can have hope and so that they can see how God worked in our life and say, oh my gosh, he did that for you and he could do that for me. Oh man, he probably wants to do more for you than me. I mean, God wants to do so much 
And I think the importance of community. Yeah. You know, I think we, you know, one of the things that, you know, Lisa, you and I have talked about more so, I would say, you know, post COVID um, than before is just this need for connection. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard enough when I feel like I'm on an island by myself in my mental state, you know, but I need to be around other people that who, who mutually like want to love me and want to look out for me and want to serve me. You know, um, Lisa and I, I, you know, Lisa and I love to talk very candidly and, and very personally, you know, there's been times when we've gone to start like our week, our weekly call and we'll, we'll get on a FaceTime call and be across from each other. And one of us can tell the other one is just like, not in a good spot, you know, and it just leads to this like beautiful, heartfelt, let's put aside all of the organics of this meeting and minister to each other. You know, where are you? And bring me into, into what's going on. And, you know, let me carry this load with you and let me, let me be of service to you. And, and I think it's beautiful because, you know, it always comes back to us. Like the Lord always does that, you know, um, there's been times when, you know, I've been able to kind of be there for Lisa and, you know, during COVID when my whole family was like, um, I love telling the story when my, my whole family was just losing their mind. It was pretty much like, we didn't really know what COVID was really about yet. So you kind of felt like everyone was just trapped in their house and you didn't want to touch anything. And you were like wiping every you know, <laughs> juice bottle that came in from the grocery store. I mean, it was like, you know, pretty much like if you had a hazmat suit, you'd be putting it on at this point. Yeah. But I remember Lisa sending me a text message and she was like, we sent you something. And there was just like all of this food that she had sent to us from like an Instacart type thing. And I remember my one daughter just being like, how did Miss Lisa know I love ramen? <laughs> it just like made her day. And there was a couple of items, Lisa, that you had added in there that you didn't know were like family yeah. favorites. Yeah. And it was just such a little love letter, like to my kids that like, this wasn't something that was necessary that needed to be done, but it was a way of, of serving each other. It was a way of saying, Hey, I see you in this spot. Here's what I can, here's what I can do to remind you you've got this, you're going to get through this. Let's see what I can do along the way. And I think that's where, that's what God does for us to, to expand our fruitfulness, not only personally, but in a way that, that benefits the kingdom Yeah, is when I'm in service of somebody else, sometimes it's the person looking on that is being inspired. Sometimes it's the person who's, who's receiving who feels wanted, loved, acknowledged. And sometimes it's a person that's giving that feels this surrender of, okay, I just gave the last bit of, you know, my extra money for the week in service to this person. And then they get to see how the Lord shows up for them in a powerful way because of, of that. So there's always beautiful, I think you've said this word before, Lisa, there's all these beautiful graces that are being distributed and we can really become more of a part of them when we become active in our mutual service. And I think that's probably one of the biggest words that Lisa and I would like to get across here when we're talking about fruitfulness is that we're not called to be passive participants. You know, even right now in this Holy Week, we're supposed to be walking the Via de la Rosa. Like we're supposed to be walking the way of the cross with the Lord. It's supposed to be an active engagement, not a, a passing, you know, a passive, oh, look, there's, you know, Jesus must be walking the road at this time. This is what's going on, you know, at, outside of, you know, temporal time. This is what's happening. This is what would have been happening at that time. We're called to engage, yeah. You know, we're called to be, to actively engage in what's happening liturgically in the church and also what's happening right now amongst the body of the church. Mm -hmm. So I think like as we start to kind of, you know, tie this up, we desire fruitfulness, you know, for our brothers and sisters. We want you to feel an abundance of these, you know, fruits of the Holy Spirit. And we think that 
you know, these five steps are a great way to kind of give you a, a strategy, you know, of getting there. Yeah. And it's calling us really kind of forward, you know, as we're wrapping up uh, Lent and as we're wrapping up our time with our participants in the Do You Want to Be Well course, um, that in these final weeks, these are these kind of things that are going to prepare us to go forth, right? It's like we've kind of been um, in, in a little kind of bubble with each other in a way of journeying, you know, and stuff. And we want to say, like, what happens at the end of Mass when they say, go forth to go, you know, proclaim the good news, you know, go forth and preach the gospel, whatever the, the sending forth that they say, you know, and stuff is that way to say, hey, you know, we've we've been able to kind of sit at Jesus's feet for a bit for this time. He's been doing this work in us. Lent was like this. Next week, we're going to be telling our resurrection stories. That's going to be really cool. Inviting our past speakers back, inviting all of our ladies to come and share what God's been doing. But this is the part of it, you know, I'd say like we had this nun come um, once to speak to us at, at um, Franciscan University. She was a Carmelite and she said this, like this is where the rubber hits the road, right? This is where, you know, like our faith actually has to become this thing that we know, you know, we know this person, Jesus. We know these things about our faith. We hear the words in the scriptures. We go to mass. We receive the sacraments, whatever those things are. They're all coming at us. They're filling us up. They're bringing us those things. But if we don't do anything with it, then how are we? We're, we're, we're you know, it's like the the person that buried the talent, you know, and stuff like that, or the 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 light that's hid under the bushel. God's given us this great gift, and you know, we sit there and we just kind of waste it, you know, in a way that we just like, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to, my faith, I don't want, I'm like uncomfortable about that. Well, I'll get comfortable with being uncomfortable you know that's that's another key right there guys get comfortable with the uncomfortable and it was like this moment in the chosen where jesus was just talking to peter and peter's he's calling matthew and peter's sitting there he's like what do you know what this guy has done i mean seriously he's like get used to different you know it's like the, you know get that's used to being line. yeah get used to being uncomfortable Get used to the ways that I work are not your ways. And so if we can do these five things, this is going to help us. That's what this time was meant to do. So thank you for just taking this time with us. This was just meant to be a bonus time. Um, you know, we thought, thankfully, we didn't do like an Instagram live. I don't think anyone would have lasted an hour and 15 minutes with us. But this was meant to just be some extra like pouring out into you that the Lord inspired um, in us so that we could kind of help us prepare for these last couple of weeks and be ready to kind of go forth and preach with our lives and take what we've learned and try to help another sister on the road or another brother that's going through something. And, oh gosh, I learned about that. And I have some, um, you know, things to share with you so that we can encourage each other to, you know, being restored and I think that the biggest thing that we have to realize is that this work is an ongoing process. The restoration is not going to, well, we've spent eight weeks on it and now, you know, here we go. No, like you have to keep taking what you've been learning and going forth and trying to apply that to your life, sitting there and, and like listening maybe to that talk again or going back to some of the handouts that we've given you to be able to learn deeper and just take that into, you know, what God wants to reveal to you. What, what do you want me to learn from that person? What do you want me to learn from, you know, this week? What do you want me to learn on this topic, Lord? What little nugget might be in that, you know, in that little folder or something like that? And I think that those are all things that we can continue to live out this restoring work of God, which is when God does this, he's bringing us back to the truest sense of our identity. You know, restoration isn't that he just gives you what you had. You know, it's not like we go into an old house and we just restore it exactly to how it was. And we're just like, ooh, look, we just made it. We just patched up that wall. So now it looks kind of like how it did before. No, like we're getting into the foundation of the house. We're gutting out all these different things. And we're making this gl more glorious than it ever was before because God doesn't just give back what you had. When the scriptures, when he restored things, he would do things greater than what they began with. So if the locusts ate the fields, 
they'd have twice as much, you know. So think of God always restoring you, that he wants to do something greater in you, which is what the resurrection was. His suffering was horrendous, horrific, awful, agonizing. His glorious resurrection is beyond compare in terms of what you look, what he went through. And for all eternity that he is gloriously resurrected as the son of God. There's no comparison. This is always greater. It's always greater. Yeah. All right. Let's do this.